Oscar Bevis for IFL TV in association with MTK Global. Delighted to be joined once again. I think you was one of my first lockdown interviews by Lou De Bella, donning a colourful, like a tie-dye baseball jersey. <laughs> yes, it's, it's, it's the San Francisco Giants uh, baseball jersey that they wore uh, last year on Grateful Dead Day. So I'm wearing a, uh, I'm pretty colourful right now, yeah. Young Oscar Bivis, it's good to be with you. Thank you very much. Um, first things first, congratulations on being a Hall of Fame inductee for 2020. I know that obviously they can't have the ceremony and they're going to sort of merge it with uh, the 2021 ceremony. Um, it must be nice to be recognised, I suppose. <laughs> Everyone likes being recognised for their work. Yeah, it, you know, it, it really is, honestly. And um, look, I, I'm, I'm going to admit my age because I just turned 60 in the middle of this pandemic. But when I turn around, I realise I've spent over half my life in boxing. So um, it's nice to be recognized for doing your best in a sport that you love as much as I love boxing. And I've given a lot of my life to this, uh, to this sport. So it, it, the recognition is, is, it's humbling and it's also very rewarding. Uh, and, you know, and my mom's 86 years old. And God willing, um, she'll stay away from this, this virus and she'll be able to go in 2021. But, um, but I think that it, was, it meant a lot to her too. And I was very happy that, she's around to share the fact with, you know, even though there wasn't a ceremony this year, you know, she knows I was in and, and I think it meant a lot to her and, and, and I'm happy that she was, is around to, to have seen this. I just want to quickly brush over the sort of situation of where you are. Um, all we hear over here is that America's getting worse and getting worse and progressively worse. It, 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 it's almost surreal, but it's, it, it's surreal too, because we have an asshole running our country that won't put on a mask. And he's, he's acting like a mask is a sign of people being snowflakes and weaklings. So you have all these other assholes that support him, and particularly in states that are very, very pro-Trump, where they just won't wear masks and they won't socially distance. And the virus is raging right now. Interestingly, where I am in Long Island, New York, is my town hasn't had a case in three weeks. And New York City and, and Long Island are getting much better, but that's because people here are doing the right thing. And um, and a lot, but but most of the country right now is in the opposite direction. Things are very very crazy here right now. And 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 I think that's one of the reasons, by the way. Eddie's not a bad guy, and Eddie and I don't dislike each other. We just we bump heads a lot, but but I don't think Eddie fully understands what's going on in the states right now with this virus. And um, and I think that affected the Taylor Serrano stuff. Yeah, because that's obviously why I'm asking. It's easy to sort of try and translate what you hear through the TV, but when you're in that position like yourself, you see a first-hand account of you telling us exactly what's going on from where you are is a bit more accountable. Um, I, I suppose I can only speak about it from a boxing sense because that is what we're here for. I remember one thing you told me when we last spoke was that you have a lot of fighters who struggle financially. You guys, you wouldn't consider the big guns, the big names. Um, I suppose there is light at the end of the tunnel for those guys, though. Now we're starting to see boxing coming back. Yeah, but you're seeing. You're also seeing. Look, there was going to be a re. You and in fact, I think we discussed this, Oscar. I told you. I thought there was months ago. I told you. In fact, I think I told you in January actually that I thought there was going to be a readjustment of purses and spending in boxing, um, with or without the pandemic. Because in January, I didn't know there was going to be a pandemic. But particularly with the pandemic, there's been a readjustment. But I think everyone has to readjust. Managers, promoters, fighters. It's a very difficult time. I'm explaining to my fighters that I can negotiate as much as I can for them, but that the world has changed. And if you're, if, if you're presented with an opportunity, it doesn't mean another one's going to come in two weeks or a month or even three months. So right now, I mean, I have had a bunch of fighters who have accepted fights on ESPN and, um, and they're, the, the purses are not extraordinarily high, but, but they're able to bring home a payday and, and take on up, take advantage excuse me, of, the, of, of what's going on right now and, and take advantage of an opportunity that's presented to them. That being said, if a fighter says to me, Lou, I'm not comfortable going to an airport or getting on an airplane right now, and I'd rather wait till this whole thing is over, because I've explained to all my fighters, the pandemic's going on, their contracts are extending, and even though f boxing's going on in certain little pockets or places, things obviously aren't back to normal. So... Um, you know, I, I, I respect their opinion if they don't want to do it, but I also think it's admirable when they're staying in shape and they're ready to go and they take advantage of the opportunity. Um, 
you know, I, I think in the in the I think in the Serrano situation, I think Eddie believes that Amanda getting on that reality show uh, that had nothing to do with boxing or MMA, it was uh, or combat sports. It was a reality show on the entertainment end of Telemundo was the reason why she's not going. And um, I don't think so, actually. I think, and by the way, she didn't really accept the reality show or talk about it until after the July date was postponed. And then I had gone to her for not a 50% cut. I never discussed the money, but for a cut in her money that she said, I'd rather, I'd rather wait. And I went back to Eddie and Eddie said, well, if they're going to wait, they're going to have to wait a long time because I'm not going to pay her the full purse um, until I can sell tickets. And then Eddie changed his mind, which is, he's allowed to do. But by the time he changed his mind, things got... See, it's not only that by the time he changed his mind, she had the reality show. It's also by the time he changed his mind, the virus went out of control here again. So, I mean... If I'm not willing to get on an airplane as her promoter to go to the matchroom compound, and I'm not, I'm 60 years old, and I'm not going to take her, take that kind of risk right now with the way airports are here and, and the virus is spreading, then it's very hard for me to, to say that the fighter and her manager are wrong. And, you know, people see videos of Amanda working out. Um, she lives in a, in a building that has a gym in it, and they have the key. So at, at our, you know, the, the gym is still closed, but they're letting her go in with the side times with Jordan to train, but there are no, not a single boxing gym is open in New York. In fact, there are a bunch of boxing gyms trying to get the governor to open the gyms at least for professional fighters, you know, but there are no boxing gyms open and literally in the New York area, there is no sparring. I don't think I'd want to go to Eddie's backyard and fight um, uh, Katie Taylor if I'm Amanda and I can't be adequately prepared you know and, and, and again I'm not cursing out Eddie or whatever I I get where he's coming from and I get his frustrations but we're in a really fucked up time and I'm not willing to you know I, I think in this time we got to cut people more slack in general than we usually do not only the fighters the promoters the managers everyone and we're people we bumped in, into in the street with our masks on whoever I think we need to be a little bit more understanding that these are horrendous times for everybody and everybody's under a lot of stress, you know, and, um, you know, I, 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 I I'm, you know, I, I hope the fight happens at some point on a, on a later date. It's not going to happen on August 22nd. When we saw on Twitter the discussion surrounding the financial side, it's strange because people like to compare the financial side of boxing to one in a legacy defining fight. But aren't the legacy defining fights the big paydays? And isn't Serrano and Taylor the that biggest is a payday legacy. and the biggest legacy fight? It's both. It's both. But by the way, if you're fighting a legacy fight, wouldn't you want to fight it fully trained and prepared? You know? Um, and by the way, some fighters deal better with fighting without sparring than others. I actually, I'm not going to mention who, but I've promoted some fighters that barely ever sparred in their careers that viewed sparring as too much of a wear on their body and would spar only a dozen rounds, eight rounds before a fight. I know other fighters that absolutely would never get into a ring if they couldn't spar, you know, a substantial number of rounds. Um, I, I, I don't know if you read my tweet the other day, but I, Oscar said something about, well, take your legacy fights. If you really care about boxing, you know, you can't be totally concerned about the money. You've got to be concerned about your legacy. And I, I sort of took issue with that because I agree with you. I think the legacy fight and the money fight in a normal world would be the same fight. If the fight's a fight for your legacy, wouldn't it be the biggest fight? And if it's the biggest fight, if it's the legacy fight, shouldn't you get your a higher purse or, or your best purse or one of your best purses? So I, I tend to agree with that. Um, and by the way, when I, when I, I wanted to clarify something too, because when I tweeted out about Billy Joe Saunders. Um, I was going to ask you about that actually. Yeah. Yeah, when he said he wasn't going to be ready, some people always want to interpret that I'm jumping down Eddie's on Eddie's ass all the time. But when I made the comment like, hey, who promotes this guy? It was to say to Eddie, hey, Eddie, this fucking virus is wreaking havoc and, and it's fucking up everything. And here's one of your fighters that's using it as, you know, a reason. Um, and by the way, you know, Billy, from my understanding is Billy Joe could train. 
if you want, you know, if he was dedicated to it right now. Um, but I was just more making the point that it's, we're all in a mess together and it's affecting all of us and all of our fighters, not just Amanda Serrano, not just Billy Joe Saunders, but a bunch of people. And you know what? Eddie's coming back in his backyard and Eddie's coming back in the States at the end of August. And I'm happy to see that. And, and believe me, I wish them well. I want to see our sport healthy. I want to see events go well. Um, you know, Aaron will be the first to tell you that, that it's been a bit of a clusterfuck getting boxing back in the States. I mean, they're losing fights every day. And they're doing the best they can to keep shows afloat. But you know what, man? You know, it's it is a hard, hard, difficult time. So I'm rooting for the fight camp thing that he's doing. I'm rooting for the show he does here when he does it. But it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. And it also doesn't mean matchrooms out of the pandemic. They can't satisfy every fighter right now. And there's a lot of fights that don't make any sense to promote with no audience. The money's just simply not there. So you know, where, like, like, you know, like we discussed, I think we, we talked at the beginning of this pandemic, and I think I said the same thing I'm about to say right now, it's going to be a gradual um, and, and hopefully like graduating up kind of course of getting back to normal. However, however, when the states are running out of control with the virus again right now, I'm not so sure that there's not going to be a pullback in the states, you know? So, and there's not much we can do about it. But what makes these times so stressful, Oscar, is how little control we have. I want to jump onto the whole Twitter thing. Now, I don't want to talk about necessarily the fact that you and Eddie are having a back and forth. Everyone's seen it. We know that. But just from a general perspective, it's, it's interesting when there's quite a lot of openness surrounding fights on Twitter because, you know, we saw it with Tevin Farmer, Jojo Diaz. It turned out to give us a fight that the fans wanted. It's kind of a blessing and a curse in a way, the openness that we get sometimes on social media around negotiations. It is a blessing and a curse. Um, you know what? I like, particularly where the banter between fighters can really lead to a fight, I find that very entertaining. And I respect the fact that the fighters are out there doing self-promotion. I think some of the time when fighters make asses of themselves by making stupid comments and, and whatever, that Twitter can be a negative. Um, but I think when they're out there and they're in a good-natured way trying to build to a fight against another particular opponent. I think that's a good, very good use of Twitter. I, I got to be honest, I don't generally choose to use Twitter as a negotiating thing. And, um, and I called Eddie to discuss this with him after it happened. And Eddie and I are cool right now. I mean, you can see all the stuff on Twitter, but if you ask Eddie, I think he'd say we're cool and we're cool. I called Eddie after all of it. And I said, I wish you wouldn't have called out Amanda because it created a whole shit storm. And then what wound up happening is, you know, Eddie went out there with his point of view, but a man, it was misinterpreted by Amanda's manager, and then they attacked me. And I didn't like, and, as, and that was a result of, and that caused me to have to go back on Twitter and respond and explain. And that day, Sunday morning, I had called Eddie when I woke up, and we had an hour conversation. And, and, and we didn't agree on everything, but we, I understood his position. He understood mine. And I think he understood the fight wasn't going to happen August 22nd that, and that there was nothing I could do about that. And, and I was surprised later in the day to see it all on Twitter. And then it caused me to react. But you know what? In a perfect world, promoters can do the same kind of back and forth to try to promote, to try to build stuff. But honestly, I don't think we should really conduct our negotiations on social media or really get into arguments on social media. You know, 140 characters isn't the same as a discussion. You know what I mean? It's not the same as a conversation, you know? And um, so I prefer not to negotiate there. But if things hit Twitter and I feel like I need to clarify, I'm going to do what I got to do. Um, you work with Jerry Forrest and people were skeptical about the second chance that Jerome Miller was given by top rank. And many people will say now, rightly so. Um, at the time when something like that comes out, it's still ultimately shocking. Just what's your take on everything right now? You know what? I got to be honest with you. I, and Jerry will be the first. If you read the interviews that Jerry's been doing, he'll say this. I told Jerry that I thought the kid was probably dirty because I found out the kid had not been tested. Jarrell had not been tested from the time of the AJ fight until the day he got tested when we made this fight, which was about 26, 27 days before the date of the fight. And usually also when someone's tested in the last four weeks, it's very, very difficult to catch them. 
this, this guy managed to still get caught. But I told Jerry, look, you're running a risk that this guy is dirty. And Jerry said, I'll beat him even if he's dirty and I'm content to go through with the fight. Um, I am pissed off at, at, at Miller and he never takes any responsibility. I think, did you see the interview yeah. he did with Jeremy Hurgis? Fightnet TV, I believe they were called. Yeah. yeah. And, and I thought it was, by the way, I give credit to that. It was a very well done interview. He was able to really get to the root of things. And all you heard was a guy in denial. You didn't hear a guy owning up to any responsibility. You didn't hear a guy with any remorse. You heard a guy that's still delusional. And I'm not going to say that I favor a lifetime ban, Oscar, because I don't think I do. But I favor some kind of punishment that is more significant than we've seen for any other PED user. The reason I don't favor a lifetime ban is he wasn't even suspended this last time. And by the way, even though you have to look at him and say he appears to be a cheater and, and he appears to be addicted to these PEDs, boxing sort of failed him and itself in the last year. And I'm not just talking about the New York Commission, which didn't suspend him, or, or any, of the, the, any commission in the country, because no commission suspended him, or the Association of Boxing Commissions in the United States, which didn't suspend him or Eddie or myself or top rank or any other promoter that didn't go out there and make sure he was being tested or the WBC, BA, IBF and WBO, none of whom um, made sure he was in a testing program. Cause it's, I'm looking at the whole industry of which I'm a part and we didn't, we took this guy and we allowed him to continue running his scam. We didn't put him in a testing program that probably would have caught him before a fight had to be, redone again you know what I mean and as a result of that uh, I I think he needs to be suspended for an extraordinary length of time but if he can get his life together and clean up his act and learn to take a sense of responsibility over the next two or three years then maybe th there could be some consideration to coming back two or three years is an eternity in boxing but um but he needs to get punished now and he needs, he also needs a friend or a mentor. Um, he needs a friend or a mentor or somebody close to him to really talk to him and explain to him that he's got to own up. He's got to man up and, and he's got to be until he has some remorse or sees that he needs to change his act. Then he's not going to have the respect of his sport. I look at it from an angle that, and I'm not sure if you saw Serafina's comments on our channel also, that when he's taking these PEDs and may have an addictive personality and may feel like they rely on these PEDs, is there actually a deeper issue that someone needs to get hold of Joel Miller? And instead of just say, look, stop boxing, get hold of him and actually say, you have a problem? No, I, I think that's for Oscar. I, I, I've known this guy since he's a teenager, right? And, and even with all this shit, I have to admit that if you said to me, a lie detector test, do you like Jarrell Miller? It pro I probably like it would. I probably do. I mean, I don't think he's an evil guy, but he's got severe problems. And maybe also when you're that big a man, you know, you have you have image problems. You have problems. You can't control your weight. You have other issues. And um, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not making any excuses. He needs to be punished. And honestly, I'm fucking pissed off because PEDs in a combat sport to me. Um, are incredibly dangerous and they're a deadly weapon. Um, but that being said, he needs help. And, and, and um, if he's not willing to get it, then he doesn't deserve to ever fight again. What do you make on sort of the, the response that I've seen from many boxing fans saying that we can all target someone like Jarrell Miller, but there are people who have multiple drugs to too. And perhaps because you can't avoid them, like you said, you, you know, Jerry was against Joe Miller. There's people out there who failed drug tests that I suppose you can't, you just can't avoid in the sport if you want to get anywhere. Um, you know, look, I, I just had a conversation with Mauricio Suleiman today, actually, about because I've criticized the BC drug pro, you know, clean boxing program some, but at least they're trying. Like, the problem is right now, until the sport as a whole, and we never really are able to like think about that that statement, like the, put it in quotes, the sport as a whole, because we don't have governance of an, our entire sport. There's no commissioner like there is in FIFA, or or Major League Baseball or football in the U.S. or whatever. We're we're sort of like the wild wild west. You know, we don't have 
rules the same way other people do. So until the entire sport stands in agreement against PEDs and supporting adequate PED testing in every fight with a budget to, ca- to, to sustain it um, and make it mandatory and make it consistent across boxing, we're always going to have these problems. And PEDs are a very significant problem. And, you know, let's not forget where we were before this pandemic. We had lost four or five fighters, you know, to the sport. Um, we had lost four or five fighters in the, pe- in the previous 12 months. Yeah. You know, we have to protect the health and safety of athletes. And PED use is simply unacceptable. Glove gate. This has gone on for miles too long, and you know what I mean. The bendy glove gate. Look, did you see? Well, I, I, uh, still want, I still want. I still coming? want. I want to see the. Uh, I want to see that autopsy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want to see the autopsy. Um, I don't know, man. I I don't like excuses, and and you know, um, has stuff gone on in the past? Yes, but you know, there were very experienced people sitting there when Tyson's gloves were wrapped. And, and and taped. Um, I I know Tyson Fury. I'm not saying I'm an intimate of his, but we know each other pretty well. And I don't believe there's I don't believe he would do that. And I don't believe that uh, I don't believe it. And I think it's unless you can truly prove it, I I think it's very unfair to make those kind of comments. And um, and yeah, like can you look at video from certain angles and certain shit looks weird? Yes. But you know what? I've watched other fights. People have sent me clips from other fights where you see the same thing and I don't believe anybody was cheating. You know? I, I don't like I don't like if you're gonna make those kind of accusations, you need to truly be able to prove them. Is it a bit weird mindset wise the fact that they're now talking about uh, December it was either 17th or 19th, I think it's December the 19th, uh, for the trilogy fight, and Wilder's kept himself completely quiet, and you've got people making excuses for him. It's just a, it's a, a strange mindset-wise, considering it looks like they're trying to pencil in the trilogy that the excuses are still coming up. Yeah, but you know what? I mean, honestly, there's a difference between people in your camp or your brother, you know, making a comment than you. And, and um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I haven't seen Deontay Uh, make that accusation and therefore I don't put much credence to what Marcellus is saying or what's coming out of other people um, in the press in the States. And, and, you know, um, you know, opinions, people can have, everyone says, well, you can have your opinion. Um, But if your opinion is libelous or damaging or defaming, um, it's really not that fair to express it unless you can prove it. So I, I don't like that whole narrative. You know, I, I don't. And I, I don't believe it, by the way. Yeah, and I think many people will agree with the thing you said before. I've seen angles of boxing shots where it looks like hands are popping out of gloves, etc. So, um, Regis Progre, WBO number five, I believe. Uh, I'm going to try and get his name right. Shao Jahan. I know it's Ergashev from the child of the first name. Ergashev. Shao yeah. Jahan Ergashev, yeah. No, he's a, Ergashev's a good fighter. We, um, he, and he's with Showtime, and the reason that the reason that it came up is because we had a conversation with Showtime and he's a guy that Showtime has helped develop. Um, but there's nothing imminent. We didn't, we don't even have, we don't even have an offer for the fight yet. Um, you know, Re- Regis obviously has continued to train. I need to get him into the ring. His management, Peter Berg and Sam Kakowski and their crew, they, they really want to get him into the ring. And Regis is not the kind of guy that likes to not fight. Like Regis is the kind of, Regis sent me a string of, of text messages recently when he was reading up on, like the guys like um, Sugar Ray Robinson and Jake LaMotta and those guys that used to fight almost every month. And he's like, I'd like to be that kind of guy. So he doesn't want to be, he's been sitting since Josh Taylor and the Maurice Hooker situation, which is op- absolutely no fault of Regis's. And by the way, you know, we had been hung up on that half pound between 144 and a half and 145. And I actually went back to the, the Hooker people and said, well, can you even make 145? And no one's come back and called me. So that fall, that fight fell apart for no no fault of, of Progre. I'm trying to keep I'm trying to keep Regis's name out there uh, to the greatest extent I can. I'm trying to look at every single possibility. 
with every single platform, which is difficult right now because Showtime hasn't had their first show back yet. Eddie hasn't had his first show back yet. Al and PBC haven't had their first show back yet. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's difficult. Um, but I think Regis has remained in, in the public light during this whole pandemic. He's been out there and very active and communicating, and so have I and we. And I think that that's a net positive. And also, anyone who knows Regis, look, you know Regis went for Josh Taylor in the UK and spent a month there promoting the fight before the fight when Josh never left camp. You know, yeah, Regis I mean, we, is in a fr- we went, we went to is- meet Regis a couple of times at some youth gyms, two, three weeks out from the fight, yeah. Regis isn't afraid of anybody. He's an old school fighter. He's got balls like basketballs. I mean, Regis would fight anybody, any place, anytime. And he loved England, and he'd come back to England in two seconds. And if there was an opportunity and on the matchroom farm or the matchroom estate, he would love to do it. I mean, I, I, I told Eddie we'd fight any 40-pounder in England or in the UK or Ireland. Um, but right now, we're just looking for a fight, and, and, and the kid wants to be active. And, and by the way, I think he's still one of the most compelling, talented fighters in all of boxing. 